Perfect. So, um, as I was saying, my name is Diana G. Clark Allu. I'm the Regional Marketing Manager um, for the Hall Marine Stores of Marine Maps. Uh, thank you guys again all so much for joining us for our virtual Women on Water class. Typically, we like to do these um, in a classroom setting, um, out on the water, uh, but with current, current circumstances, um, we are doing these virtually. Um, basically, how we typically do these are about an hour classroom style, um, and then a couple hours out on the water where you actually get to drive the boat, um, learn how to tie knots, dock the boat, um, so hopefully uh, in the near future we'll be able to get those going again. For the time being, this class we still cover a lot of really great things. Um, we want this to be interactive, so I'm going to be monitoring the questions um, during the entire time. So I encourage you to please ask questions. Um, Captain Graham, who's leading the class, is here at your disposal. Um, so please, if you're thinking it, um, it's not, I'm sure somebody else is thinking it too. So there's no stupid questions. Um, I just want to tell you guys a little bit about Marine Max. If you've never heard of us before, um, we are a boat dealer located here in Charleston. Um, we are the largest boat dealer in the country with over 60 stores nationally. Um, but we're also more than just a boat dealer. Um, we service your team. We um, also have great resources, such as a business manager to help you with all of the finances during your boat buying process. Um, we also put on a lot of really fun giveaways and then educational classes like this, um, our Women on Water classes. We do intro to boating classes. Um, so a lot of really great things. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Captain Graham, who's gonna be um, leading the class. Throughout the presentation, I'll be on him, but then I'll also be on the presentation. Um, so if at any point, please just speak up if you guys aren't seeing our screen, if you can't hear them, there's always things as technical difficulties, so we'll just try and get through them. Um, and then as I mentioned, this will be recorded, so I'll make sure to send this out to everybody along with the PowerPoint afterwards. And if for some reason we don't make it to your questions or you think about your questions later, you all have my contact information, please just reach out to me, let me know, you know, I can always get the answers to you later. Um, so with that being said, here's Captain Graham. I'm gonna go ahead and start the PowerPoint. Howdy ladies, Captain Graham here. Welcome to another uh, episode of Women on Water. Um, great to have you all here. Again, like Deanna said, uh, there's no such thing as a dumb question, please. If anything comes to mind, let us know and we'll answer it throughout this uh, course. We're gonna go over a few things. We've got a slideshow for you. There's a couple videos and we'll do a few demonstrations. Uh, we'll go over uh, a little bit about the local Charleston area and points of interest. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to shed some light on some topics that you might not have been uh, very up to date with. But um, I'll just introduce myself real quick. My name is Captain Graham Potter. I am the uh, delivery captain for Marine Max Charleston. I am a West Coast Guard veteran of three tours. I used to run some ferries and cruises in Boston and here in Charleston. Uh, I ran Togo US for six years as captain uh, manager of operations. So I believe me, I've, I've seen some things. I've been around the block and uh, it's good to be here. So why don't we uh, get started with our presentation? And um, I believe the first one here is going to be a uh, boat terminology. The first step in uh, learning your boat is to know uh, nomenclature or the, the proper terms. So um, maybe some people like to call it left and right. Obviously, we're going to be using nautical terms like port, starboard. Uh, if you're walking uh, towards the front of your boat, you're walking forward. But if you're walking towards the stern or the back part of your boat, you're walking aft, all right? Walking from side to side is called going a thwart from port to starboard. Uh, so has anyone um, ever, has anyone ever heard of what is your draft in your boat? That's, yes. That could be a familiar term, but some people um, really should get to know this one. It's an important one because uh, that's the amount of boat that you have underneath the water line. Right? And uh, it's especially important when you might be on a sailboat and we're dealing with tides and shallow water. Draft is very important because if you know your draft 
you know how deep you need the water to be to get through without getting stuck. Um, again, being a uh, Hobart US veteran, I've seen a lot of people getting stuck like fly paper out in the ICW, especially near marker 117, uh, near Breach Inlet. Uh, some people, uh, they think they know their draft well. And sailboats can be down about five, six feet, sitting feet. And there are certain spots in the ICW that's only about three feet to two feet, depending on the tide. So, um, what else do we have? We've got the beam. The beam of a boat is the width from port to starboard. starboard to port. And the freeboard, freeboard I, I don't think is on here, but we're going to go ahead. That's like the opposite of beam. Freeboard is the amount of water, or I'm sorry, the amount of boat that you have sitting out of the water vertically. Um, if there's any other questions about boat terminology, we're just going to kind of leave it at that basic class. I could get more in depth with you, um, maybe in our, in our future uh, classes, we'll do a little bit more of advanced terms, but we'll go on to the next slide. <clears throat> Um, I'm having difficulty pulling up the um, chat portion to see it on our end. So if you do have a question, um, just jump up, just jump in, and, and you know, turn your mute off and and let us know during the presentation. Say we're on the radio, we want to hail someone. And you identify yourself, but you don't know who you're hailing, talking to. You're trying to get someone's attention. You're going to say, hey, vessel, off my port bow. That's your port side forward. You got forward, port bow, port beam, port quarter. Off your, off your stern is aft, starboard quarter, starboard beam, starboard bow, off my bow. Or forward. Does that make sense, everyone? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Um, this one, yeah, we're good. Um, so the, the next, this one is uh, just pretty obvious. We're not going to read the whole thing, but what I do want to mention is um, why do people get thrown off of boats? Once in a while, it happens. People get ejected from their boat. It is a very dangerous situation. Uh, being in the Coast Guard for many years, I've dealt with a few of these situations where people did not have three points of contact. That just basically means have your feet on the ground and have at least one hand holding onto a bar or a seat or something sturdy on your boat. Um, if you are the operator of your boat, make sure everyone's abiding by that because if, for some reason, um, there's a lot of variables out there. You can uh, take a wake, wind can blow you all of a sudden from the beam, hit the boat. Uh, if, if the operator slows down or speeds up without telling everyone before they do it or turns uh, unexpectedly, people lose their balance very easily. It happens that quick. And once someone goes in the water, that, especially in the ICW on a busy day, I, I don't know if everyone's seen a Saturday, say maybe a Memorial Day, <laughs> very thin stretch water. If someone lands in the water there, uh, it's very dangerous. So we don't want to have any of, any of those situations. I'll go to the next slide. Um, yeah. Okay. So alcohol and voting, we're gonna touch on that real quick. It's um 0 0.08 is your blood alcohol level limit. It's the same as driving automobile on the road. So um if you are uh, deciding to drink while you vote, there's nothing actually wrong with driving and having beer. Uh, that's the only difference. But the Coast Guard or the police could uh, give you a, a Riding test on the water, and things could get uh, a little tricky. Uh, this is a pollution regulation. Every boat with an engine needs to have a discharge oil prohibited sign or placard on their uh, boat somewhere that says that you're not allowed to discharge any garbage <coughs> or sewage. I recommend having a first aid kit on board. Um, in the Coast Guard, I was an EMT, and uh, things do happen out there. You're, you're far from land and help. Uh, if you do ever need help, it could take a few hours sometimes, depending on where you are. So uh, just make sure you've got uh, you know, the basics they prepared. Uh, 
portable fire extinguishers, this is another thing that's required on your boat. Okay, this is Coast Guard regulation, and depending on the size of your boat, it's going to determine how many you need. Here's an example of one. This is one that we supply all of our boats with here at Marine Max. This is a dry chemical fire extinguisher. It's got a little gauge here, so every time you get on your boat, you should check it. <laughs> All right, it could be undercharged, overcharged, or in the green, which is where you want it. You want it to be in the green, that means good. Um, there's a big fine involved if uh, this is on your boat and it's not charged properly. Um, also, when your uh, boat starts aging a little bit, getting older, it's uh, recommended that you turn these things over uh, you know, on a monthly basis. Give it a couple of taps on the bottom because this dry chemical, it does tend to build up at the base and uh, you lose a little bit of your charge. Uh, when you really do need it. Uh, so, just a little trick to the trade. Um, we'll do a couple more things on fire. Uh, there are a few different types of fires. Pop up that slideshow for everyone to see again. Um, so, class A, there's a type of fire class A, your ordinary combustibles, wood, paper, cloth, rubber, many plastics. These things you could actually use water on. Uh, you could put water on these kind of fires and um, normally don't have any problems. But then you run into class B fires, all flammable liquids, gasoline, grease, oils, uh, flammable gases. Uh, this is something that you want to use your dry chemical fire extinguisher for because just like in a greased fire at your home, you've all been told never to put water on your stove if you get a greased fire because it, it will and can spread to other areas. And Actually, the fire uh, Class C is the other type of fire that you'll commonly see on a boat. Um, in the, the discussion of both fires, we don't commonly see fires. But a Class C uh, is an electrical fire. So again, don't use water on an electrical fire if you see arcing, sparking, blue flame, um, anything involving your electronics. Uh, first of all, it's going to fry your boat. Second of all, what happens if there's a, a puddle of water under you and you touch a, 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 an arc or a spark, you make an electrical fire worse, you could electrify yourself. So again, dry chemical fire extinguisher. This one is by uh, KID, K-I-D-D-E. That's the most common one we use. Right. Distress signals. Um, this is definitely a, a must know if you're going out boating and we want y'all women to be independent, not have to rely on anyone, but if you do end up needing help, uh, it's good to be prepared. Some of these are required by the Coast Guard to be on board, such as if you're going offshore, you need flares and smoke. Uh, we do have, stand by one second, I'll pull out my flare gun. An example of a type of flare that you can carry on board. This is made by Orion. It is just like a mini shotgun shell shooter, basically. You pop this open, you take your cartridge, and you always want to check your expiration dates on these cartridges. I know you cannot, but all of these cartridges have an expiration date. They're usually about the lifespan of three years. So you'll see a firing pin location where it's going to strike just like the end of a shotgun. You put that in so it's facing you, not the other. You don't want the muzzle facing you. See there, that's where the firing pin hits. Okay, and obviously never pointed at anything um, except the sky. You also want to take a look at what's beyond it. You're not going to shoot straight up because if it comes straight down on you, you've got a problem. You're not going to shoot it straight out because it doesn't stay in the air long enough for anyone to see. We're going to take into account the wind. So shoot it. So the wind is going sideways. Just, just not quite straight up, but you want it to have the best hang time possible. These go up about 450 feet and they burn for about three and a half seconds. So uh, the longer we can have that up and the higher it is, the farther it can be seen. All right. Other instances where you need to um, signal help. Waving arms, that's an international sign of distress. All right, well, 
if, uh, if someone's driving by and you do this, that's a good sign that you might get uh, some attention. Waving an orange or red distress flag, or shooting your flares and popping orange smoke or dye in the water. Orange is the, uh, the, the one that the Coast Guard looks for. Uh, sending out SOS, that's the, uh, uh, that's an old one. SOS, uh, we can do it like a, on your radio or you can do it with your flashlight, a spotlight. It's save our soul. Uh, VHF hailing. You could use a VHF radio um, for signaling help on channel 16. That should look, that's that's what your uh, radio should be on at all times unless you're conversing with someone. Uh, that's you don't ever converse on 16. You do on 16, but you want to keep that channel open for uh, distress calls. But the way you would do it on VHF is uh, Coast Guard, Coast Guard. Uh, this is the vessel Ann Miller, and I am in distress. My location is I have this many people on board. Please come help. They'll answer a couple questions, and then eventually they will change you to another working frequency so that other people who may need to use 16 will be able to use that to, uh, to call for. Uh, gunshots, black smoke. Uh, these are uh, a few other ways of getting people's attention uh, if absolutely necessary. Again, if you, if you don't need the attention, don't, you're not in distress, it, it's legal to use any of this. Okay. Ladies, um, my chat group chat is now up and I can see it, it's All visible. Right. So if at any time during the presentation, again, we encourage questions, so if anything come up, please don't hesitate to type in that chat or just um, turn yourselves off mute and be sure to ask us. Um, so again, we're going back to the radio portion here. Uh, I brought one of my handheld radios here just as an example, but they have plenty of uh, varieties of radio to choose from. This is just a quick handheld radio. It's cheap, get it from West Marine. So these radios can go to channel 16. They fit easily in your pocket. And uh, you can have these mounted in your boat. This is a good backup radio. It doesn't have quite the range that a installed one would. But um, again, channel 16 is your emergency um, frequency. Why not cell phones? Why do I need a radio? Because cell phones are not as reliable in the water, believe it or not. Uh, especially once you're going offshore, they only go about eight to, uh, I'd say about 13 miles from land, and then they're just used Unless it's a satellite telephone, uh, uh, VHF radio is the way to go when you're offshore. Uh, you can probably reach the Coast Guard within about 200 miles from a standard VHF radio like that. Um, when you make a VHF distress call, not only are you getting the Coast Guard's attention, you're getting all the other boats in the area. Everyone should be monitoring 16. Um, and it's a good practice because if something goes down, there will be a lot more people around you than the Coast Guard and you know, maritime uh, etiquette says, come help people that are around you in distress. So choice is obvious. Uh, VHF, very high frequency is what it stands for. There are other types of radios like UHF, that would be like a baby monitor or uh, a little talk about radio that you could buy at uh, Walmart. Uh, you have high frequency as well. Those are ham radios where you could actually talk to people on the other side of the world, very, very long distance, but they require a tower and a lot of power. VHF is the standard marine radio, and uh, normally if you're talking from from your boat to someone else, we got about 12 miles, but the Coast Guard has high sites they can reach. Um, yeah, we've got other channels that we use on these VHF radios. Uh, again, we went over 16. Channel 22 is the other Coast Guard frequency that they uh, they like to converse on. Uh, channel 9 is uh, one that you would use to hail a bridge. If you're approaching a bridge, like Wahoo Bridge, Ben Sawyer Bridge, hey, my mast is too high. Or what's the height of your bridge? Can you please open 
Um, I, I need a, an opening right now, please. Channel nine over and you know, they will actually answer you and tell you uh, when they will be able to open. Some bridges open on a schedule, some bridges open on demand, uh, but channel nine is for all bridges. There's a few other channels really that uh, commercial purposes that are for commercial purposes, but um, really anything but those uh, nine, 16 and 22, you can, you can use uh, radio other people on, on the water, such as your friends, family. Uh, DSC is digital selective calling. This is just a, uh, a new, it, within the last few years, this is a new feature on radios. It's just a button that you press on your radio. And if you have it registered with the Coast Guard, it needs to be registered. Um, but it, it is optional. But if you want this button to work, it radios your position, uh, your name, your address, and the type of boat that you're on. And this is all done by the push of a button. It lets the Coast Guard know that you're in need of help and you don't have to waste time explaining everything, especially when you're in a tricky situation. Um, there is a weather channel on the VHF radios. They all have a WX button. You can get the local weather area. Very convenient. All right. And uh, that's about as much as I want to radio. So, cold weather boating. We're blessed here in Charleston. We don't have to deal too much with cold weather. We have about three months where it does dip down into the 30s, 20s. I've seen about 18. That's the coldest I've been out here in Charleston. Again, I come from New York and I've been stationed at the Coast Guard in Lake Tahoe where it's gone down below zero and it is tough. But anyway, we're not gonna dress in one big coat. We're gonna wear many little layers. Uh, neoprene is a good first layer and a good windbreaker on the outside. Uh, cotton is not always the best because it doesn't, um, it absorbs a lot of water, it takes forever to get dry. And uh, wool is one uh, material that insulates while wet. Neoprene uh, is best for the inner layer. Um, okay, the, um, and also a, a wool hat would be definitely recommended because even if it's wet, keep your head um, warm. Uh, most of your body heat's lost from your head, armpits, and crotch. Um, so that being said, if for some reason, God forbid, you do get ejected from your boat, health position, this is something I learned in the Coast Guard, it's called heat escape lessening position. Uh, basically, that just means keep your arms tucked. And if you're floating around with your life jacket in the water, your arms are going to be tucked, knees are in, Back of your knees are sheltered, uh, and you're just going to float and keep your chin tucked. Um, keep your head out of the water as much as possible, and your hands clasped tightly around your knees. I had a question from Shannon. What is the language of security? Security. Is that pronounced security? Security. Oh, okay. <laughs> Correction, Captain Graham. Um, which is also in that same category as pon, 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 pon. You might have heard the Coast Guard say that on the radio. Um, pon, pon is also spelled P-A-N. So uh, it's just the way that they pronounce it. But security means um, all listeners. This is a um, message about uh, local navigation updates. So if you hear a security, security, Hello, all stations of the United States Coast Guard. We're uh, calling about um, a navigational hazard. A lot of the times, securities are, uh, say, a ship sunk somewhere, and we have a hazard. And if you have a deep draft vessel, draft, um, you might actually be in danger of hitting whatever's under. Or if someone recalls, like I've called the Coast Guard and I've reported in large uh, pieces of dock floating down the river. Um, after a lot of big rainstorms or hurricanes, you've got a lot of things in the water that could be a huge uh, danger to run into, especially at night. So I call these things in, especially like a 20 foot piece of dock. If you hit that with your boat, uh, this could be a catastrophe. Uh, the Coast Guard will take the information of what you found and they'll dis uh, dis uh, disseminate that information to everybody on the radio with a security message to let everyone know, be careful in that area. I hope it's not bad. 
have some videos on these um, on how to tie some common useful knots. Um, but do you want to start with how to throw a line properly? I'm going to go ahead and exit the presentation and zoom on to you. How to do that because there's nothing that bothers me more than having to sort through a box of lines that's just a wrap mess. Okay, so say you need to throw a line to someone. Maybe you're approaching a dock, maybe someone's in the water, maybe you're rafting up to your buddies at the sandbar and the wind's blowing you away, but you can throw a line and they can help, they can help pull you in. So here we are. We've got the eye of the line. It doesn't actually have to have an eye, but I like to throw the line a uh, portion that does not have an eye. So the eye is for me. I. I will take a couple loops, and it takes a little bit of a twist of your wrist to make them neat. No, nice neat loops so that they're not going to bind up and knot on you when you decide to throw it. All right, now I'm going to take my right hand, I'm a righty, and I'm gonna take about half of that line. Maybe a little more than half. I'm gonna hold the end of the other. This is going to allow me to check behind me, make sure I don't hit anything on my boat, because um, I used to teach line throwing, and this is actually an art. It is harder than it looks, especially in the wind on a boat that's rocked and it's windy, bad seas. You know, <laughs> make sure you don't hit anything behind you and it's not going to get caught in knots and then you can just toss it. You should be able to, when you haven't mastered, um, fully extend that line um, up to about 70 feet. That's flawless. Well, I'll tell you, uh, sometimes the line gets very uh, crusty. And gross. Uh, sometimes it helps to actually dip the part that you're throwing in the water, get a little extra weight. A little extra weight helps it fly straight. <laughs> this is getting too fun. I'm going to break something in. <laughs> That's good. I didn't want to talk on the phone anyway. We knocked the phone off. <laughs> what else we got? We got a video for you. So tying a line to the cleat. Um, now you brought a cleat with you as well, right? So yeah. go ahead and grab that while I pull up the video, see if we can get the video working. Um, ladies, I haven't tested a video on the Zoom before, so let's give this a, a try. Let's see if it works. Um, can you ladies see the animated knots on my screen? Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and hit play. So right now they see this. Okay. This is a perfect example of how a cleat should be hitched on with a line. Anything more than this is uh, actually going to be unnecessary, time consuming, and uh, overkill. So Captain Graham, I'm going to go ahead and put it back to you and maybe you can come a little bit closer to the sure. camera and do a little bit of a live demonstration sure. for us. You're also going to have cleats on your boat. So the way that your your line should be prepared before you even throw the line to the cleat. Um, this is going to be a tough one, actually. I chose a bad cleat to can't shove it through. Well, okay, we're going to have to imagine because I can't know. All right, so you pull it like that right there. You see there's a hole in the middle of the cleat. All right, this is your boat. You're going to want to shove this eye, your, your eye, through the middle of that cleat. And then around, it's going to be like that. Okay, we're, we're going to call this through the middle. And then it'd be, it's going to go around both horns. But say, oh no, I guess if that's not going to work. The, the only other thing that you can do, because this eye is too small, you can loop it around 
and then go over one horn like that. That'll also work for temporary purposes. But we'll we'll go ahead and I think you all have seen that before. We're gonna go ahead and do the uh, the portion where if you throw the line to someone and you want to, or you're just gonna moor your own bow to stop. The line's going to come around. Gonna come around, that's one round turn. Then we're gonna cross over, cross over again. We do a loop. That's the tricky part. So depending on which direction it's coming from or going to, but it's going to end up like a pretty uniform looking pleat hitch here. These, these last two lines underneath the loop, this is a lock, basically they call it. Uh, they're going to be parallel underneath the lock. I'll do it one more time. And this time will come from a different direction. I'll also send the links of um, the tie videos that are in this video, so that way you ladies can practice at home on your own. Is there any way you could hold it up? I can't, could, yes, perfect, okay. Thank you. I'll start from, so. We're gonna go around, full round turn. All right, now we're crossing over. Cross over again. So now we have a full figure eight. And on this one, now the tricky part is which way do we twist it? Make it look pretty. So a lot of people do too many, and they'll do like, they'll, uh, they'll do about five locks, and uh, it just takes forever to undo. And uh, yeah, if you don't know how to tie knot, tie lock, right? The, the amount of friction that that applies to the cleat will be enough to, uh, be stronger than your line. Your line will snap before it uh, pulls off of the cleat due to friction. We're going to have to close the hitch to the rail. You want to try that yeah. one? Okay. Well, this is my favorite. This is a very useful one, especially when you're uh, um, you're realizing that you're approaching the dock. Oh no, I forgot to put my fenders out. And I don't want to ding the side of my boat. These uh, fenders should be equipped with lines already. These are just examples that we have here laying around, but you know, fenders should have lines ready on them. So I'll just go ahead and feed this for now. Uh, you can play the video and then we will do one here. Yep. Okay. It's simple, it's elegant, and it's very quick, useful. This is for attaching a line to a rail or a pole, and it's just called making fast. It's not a knot, but it is a hitch, and uh, it can support as much weight as you give it. I, can, I will hang myself with, by my hands on the end of a, a cloak hitch, and it will not undo itself if it is done properly. Um, there are a couple drawbacks about the cloak hitch. Over time, they do work themselves out. So it is, um, if you do want to get down to the nitty gritty, we can show you how to get, mitigate that later. But we'll do one now. All right, here's my fender. Uh, I'm going ahead and tie it with a bowling, but we'll go over that next. So I have a, Makeshift pole here, and my lovely assistant Deanna is going to hold for us. Okay, all right. So I'm going to do a full round turn. We're going to come around the other side, do another round turn. Let's do 
right there. Is that better, easier to see? Okay, now with this part that I'm holding, we've done two round turns. We're gonna sneak that up, the, the crossover. The spot that crossed over, we're just gonna suck that through and it is going to look like so. I probably make it look easier than it is, but it does take repetitions. It is, oh, we've got some people that want to try, so I'll walk them through it again one more time. I'll go ahead and slide it off. So, this is a pole on our boat, and we're hanging our fender. This is a very, very useful one, and you'll impress the heck out of your husband with this one. Okay, so, we're gonna droop it over the top, right? At this point, we're actually gonna we're gonna make sure that we're at the right height for our boat. So the fender needs to be in between the boat and the dock. All docks have different heights, right? Some docks do, some docks don't. And some boats are higher and lower with their freeboard. So we determine the right height. Loop it around, do our round turn. All right, we're gonna cross over. I have very long lines, so there it is. Okay, so now we're coming back up. Just another round turn. So with that part that just came up, it's actually going to get tough underneath the crossover. This is what we look like this. X marks the spot. Now we do have this on recording if you do want to watch it later, again. But many, many repetitions makes it a lot easier. You should be able to do that in under 10 seconds, once you get good. What else we got, Deanna? The next one we have is the round turn and two half stitches. So I'll go ahead and play the video for that one. Two and a half hitches. I know we got a good one for that one. It's easier to see the video in these segments. Here, I just thought I had it up. Here it there is. is. All right, I'll go ahead. This is um, an alternative to the clove hitch. I, I personally like the clove hitch better just because I guess I'm faster at that one. I don't know. But we'll go and do this one too. It goes, it does a, a full round turn around that pole. And then it does a clove hitch on itself. That's basically what you're seeing. I'm going to play it one more time and yeah. then we'll have you do it. So it's a round turn and then a clove hitch on it. Just like we did on the so this is also good for making fast a line to a pole or a rail. Do you need some mail? No, I have one yet. I forgot I have this class. <laughs> I wanted to take pictures of the patient's rock. And now I'm going to start following me. Uh, let me know if it's written. Look around and see if there's anything missing that you see. Uh, yeah, see if the garage door's working. The power's there. Uh, voices in the background. Are you there for inspection? No, I just got my trip yesterday. Martha? All right. Okay. Martha is on mute. The downturn and two and a half inches. Here we go. So you go over the top of the pole of your boat. There's one round turn. It's going to do a, basically another round turn on itself and another round turn on itself, making a clove hitch on itself. Like that, it's very easy. Um, and it, 
it, it will hold as much weight as you give it. And you'll always be able to untie it no matter how much weight you put on it. Put it right here with one more quick time. There you go. We're going to get a little closer. We're going to ask Deanna to get a little taller. There you go. So, over the top, around to the bottom, it's going to face down now. We're going to do a round turn on itself, feed it through, and another round turn on itself, feed it through. There it is. Round turn too, too heavy. Next. Bowline. Uh, pronounced Bowlin. Spelled Bowline, I know. Bowlin. This is uh, like stage two, level two difficulty. It does get a little tough to remember this one. And it's the famous rabbit in the hole trick. So whenever you get to master this one, you start to uh, gain some faulty points here. Um, here's the video showing you step by step the rabbit. You make a hole, the rabbit comes out of the hole, around the tree, comes out of the hole, goes around the tree, back into its hole. And the trick is, where do you pull it to make it taut? That's where it kind of gets tricky done making the formation. So we'll do one here. I like to have my left hand higher than my right. Lower. Okay, with my right hand, which is lower, I will make a loop, I'm turning my wrist inward, making a loop. It's very important that you do it the same way I do right now, or else you're going to get lost. Okay, if you haven't done it before. So again, left hand higher, knuckles down, right hand, twist inward, and make a loop, a small loop. All right. Keep your left hand high. This is your rabbit. He's coming out of the hole from the back towards your face. All right, don't pull all the way. Just kind of pull a little bit right here. Go around the tree, which is the back of your forefinger, and back into the hole that you created. Not the big hole at the bottom, but that little hole. Okay, and then you pull like so. We got the bowling. We'll do it one more time. I'll speed it up a little bit or I'll slow it down. Does everyone want me to slow down? Speed up? Jump on my hands? Jumping jacks. All right. Left hand high, right, right, right hand low. Twist inward, make your hole. Grab it out of the back of the hole. He goes around the back of the tree. Back into that hole, that little hole, not the big hole, but the little hole. Pull these two lines right here down. And you've created a temporary eye in your line. Here's the drawback of a bull. And once you put a lot of stress on that, you would say maybe tie your boat up to a dock and uh, been sitting there for a few days. It's very difficult to get these out. So it is called a temporary eye. And it also uh, reduces the breaking strength of your line. So usually if, uh, say, you had a nice eye in your line like this and it's snapped, well, don't worry. You don't need to go and buy a new line right away. You'll make yourself a bowling. And you'll save your boat from floating away. And as soon as you get proficient, all you have to do is really that quick, boom, you've got a new mooring line. So we do have a couple more um, knots. So we about, you could probably talk knots for days. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. So we can okay. make sure we get to the questions portion. And again, ladies, I will make sure to send you that link. Um, this actually has the link to all those knots that you can have fun with on your own. And now we're talking rules of the road. The road. All right. Well, 
I'm a commercial operator and I, uh, at one point, was required to take a test on these. Uh, you as a recreational boater, probably, you're not required to know, but it is good to know a few of these, especially when it comes to um, rules of the road, who gets right of way in a crossing situation. I know we've dealt with this a lot. It's not like driving on the road. It's uh, people are coming from all different directions. And uh, who gets to go in front of the other? Uh, there is an etiquette, and it is in writing. Um, so, Rules of the road also dictates if uh, if you use a short blast of your whistle or horn, that means you're going to alter your starboard and passport, of course. Just like the top dictation here. Um, if you're going to go start to starboard and alter course to the left, that's too short. Um, now, let's just say uh, if you don't know anything and you don't remember anything from this class, please take this one into account. Remember this one. The um, Default thing to do in a situation where two boats are coming at each other, uh, go right. Turn right. So if everyone goes right, no one will ever hit each other uh, when it's a one-on-one -on -one crossing situation. Because uh, where it becomes a danger is when someone's like, oh, I, I remember that one thing I'm supposed to do, I go right. And if that other guy, the, the jerk, doesn't know anything, he makes a left, all of a sudden you've got an incident. So, as soon as you feel that the person that you're crossing does not know what they're doing, come to all stop or bear steerage, you know, just fast enough to steer a little bit until you figured out what their objective is. You can try calling them on the radio, um, you can use your lights, you can use your horn, whatever you gotta do to get their attention. Um, overtaking situation. This is when one boat is going this way and you're in the boat behind them or you're being overtaken, but if uh, someone's coming up from behind another, and going around. You can go either direction you want. Um, it's best uh, that you hail them on the radio to discuss that. But um, you know, th if you are overtaking them, just know that the person that you are overtaking, if they make a, a course change because they don't know you're behind them and you hit them, it's your fault. All right? So being overtaken, you have the right of way because you can't assume that people know what's going on behind them. Does that make sense? If there's any questions, please let me know. Um, here we go as a crossing situation. This is usually the most common, uh, where two boats are coming at each other at an angle. Uh, sometimes it's day, sometimes it's night. We'll consider this because we can see these light these colors, this picture. Uh, one side is red, one side is green. All right. These are uh, also the colors of your navigation lights on a boat. All boats are required to have navigation lights, uh, but if depending on the size of the boat, we're just going to say that um, these boats are over six feet and they need to have the red and green lights. But some small boats only have a white light. But anyway, um, red is your port side. Port is your red side. Right? If someone says it's on the red side or on the green side, um, so just know that every boat has a red light on their left or port side and a green light on the starboard. Um, in a crossing situation, if you see that red light on another boat, stop. Don't stop, just let them have the right of way. This is basically like a stop sign for you. They have right of way because they see you're green. That's like their, their go sign. Um, you know, I know it seems a little complicated, but in the daytime that also applies, even though that you don't see the lights, the lights aren't on, if you see their port side, that's their red side. You have to let them go. Um, now, we also have red and green uh, when it comes to channel markers and buoys, day boards. Um, the, uh, the one thing that you should take from this section is uh, red right return. I know most people have heard that. Red right return means if you're coming from a larger body of water or the ocean, into a smaller body of water like the river. The red buoys are going to be on your right. I'm not going to say anything more because I don't want anybody to get uh, misconstrued. It, it does change when you're on the ICW though. Um, so I, I think the best way to put it is uh, red right return when you're coming from sea. Now when you're ICW, 
That is the intracoastal waterway. We have that running right through Charleston. Right? That goes from the north to south. Uh, if you go up on the north side of the ICW here in Charleston, you're going up towards Isle of Palms, Southern Down, Capers, Louise, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and then down south, taking the Stono River, heading down towards Bohick. But um, the ICW, they have red and green as well. And red, is, red right south, that's what you tell yourself because you need to know where you are in that channel. If you go outside the channel markers, there's a lot of places that get uh, very shallow and there are some rocks, oyster beds that you don't want to run into. So keep red on your right when you're heading south to the ICW. Uh, if you see any of these other little buoys here, like the white ones and the yellow ones, stay clear of those if they're danger marks. Uh, it could be a multitude of other different things that you don't want to be in. Uh, so, we've ignored the red, right, south, or we took the wrong side of the buoy, or we drove too fast at night. Whatever have you, we've ran aground. Don't worry, you're not the only one who's done this. Uh, even I have once, uh, when I didn't mean to. And uh, yes, uh, I did it. I've done it many times on purpose, but when you run aground and you're going fast, it can be scary. You might get stuck for a while. Uh, and they say there's only two types of captains uh, ones that have run aground and ones that will. So, welcome to the club. Anyway, I have a question from Carla. Yeah. Which two or three mm -hmm. knots are the most important to know? Uh, loaded question. It depends on what work you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, for me, I would say the Bolin because it's very useful to make an eye in a line and uh, a clove hitch because it's fast. Once you, once you've mastered that one, um, you can tie your fenders up very quickly and you protect your boat. Uh, but also, you know, I, I don't really know your situation, but I would also try to find time to learn the square knot um, to join two types of, two types of lines together. Um, and uh, yeah, really, it's a situational. But Bolin and Clofitz are my favorite. I use those more often than most. We have last time. Oh, okay, yeah. So running aground. Um, if you do find yourself aground, um, it depends what the tide's doing is what you should do. Now, if the tide's falling, the clock is ticking because the, the water level is only getting less and less. So uh, what you can do, obviously, make sure everyone's okay on your boat. Make sure you're not taking on any water and your engine is okay. All right, everything's fine. You just touched some soft mud. Good. Raise your engine up a little bit and back straight off what you hit. Never try to power through it and do a big loop because chances are you're not just hitting a tiny little sandbar. You're hitting uh, a shoal that's actually getting less and or uh, it's getting shallower and shallower as you go forward more. So back straight off after raising the engine up, um, just so that the blade is still in the water. The trailer needs to have uh, a little bit of water to pull you. Um, so we'll, we'll go over tides and currents. This is a big one here in Charleston. We have a uh, high tide and low tide twice a day. That's called a semi-diurnal tide, number seven. Uh, some places only have one high tide and one low tide per day, and that is a uh, diurnal tide. The high and low, the difference uh, ranges here. Uh, I've seen it as high as 10 feet higher than normal, and um, you know, from high to low, I've seen a 10 foot tidal difference a day. This is during a spring tide or a king tide when the moon and the sun are aligned perfectly. It happens. Once or twice a year. It's, uh, there's another one called the neap tide. It's the opposite of the spring tide, where the difference is much less. The difference between high and low could only be four feet. Uh, it depends on where in Charleston you are as well. Uh, usually, on an average, the tidal difference is six feet in the, in the harbor. If you go to Church Creek down near uh, Bohicket and Guadalajara Island, that's uh, we're looking at eight to nine foot tidal difference. I'm not going to get into why. There's a, there's a lot of different factors, and there's a science to it. 
but uh, you know when you have storms approaching that can also affect your tides uh, depending on what side of the storm you're on you could end up getting a, a serious tidal difference well, we have a uh, river abdominance let's talk about uh, rivers and currents right here is the cooper river and that comes all the way from santee cooper lakes you know, uh, moultrie and marion there's a lot of water involved there I mean, when it has that much water um, it, it's actually draining out to sea a lot more often than it's coming here. Uh, currents can be your friend or your enemy when you're trying to moor your boat. And uh, unfortunately, we are doing these by Zoom and we're not doing any underway, get your hands on the stick and get dirty kind of uh, boat operating time. But we will soon in the future, I'm sure, once uh, COVID kind of die down. Um, Charles, tide specifics, if there's any other questions about those, let me know because uh, we, we can talk all day about that. Docking a powerboat, I'd love to show you a video here uh, about basically how uh, how to do it calm, cool, and collectively. This uh, can be tricky and it takes a lot of practice. And uh, we'll just walk you through this video. Another captain from a different Marine Mac. Is he speaking? Because I can't hear it. Yes. Okay. So if you guys um, um, can't hear it, uh, it was a good thing. Just sum it up. Have your lines and fenders ready. Your lines are hooked up to your cleats already, and your fenders are hooked up to your cleats. Um, make sure that your fenders are going to be at the right height to match the dock, and. Um, that they're in the right spot on your boat to deal with the curvature, all right? So your boat normally has a flat area, and then see, it on, an, on the bow, if you put a fender on the bow of your boat, it's really not gonna do anything because it's not gonna make contact with the dock. You wanna have two fenders at least, one in the mid and one in the stern, so that your boat is nice and cushioned for that controlled, slow contact flush with the dock. Um, you want to have a little bit of main, uh, maintain a little bit of way on or momentum heading towards the dock, and you want to turn before you apply the power of your throttle. If you hit the throttle and you're turned the wrong way, and then you turn, you've just blown your opportunity to come in smoothly, and you'll have to go do a loop, just like a new, and try it again. So always turn, then apply power. Um, and and lady, sorry that that video didn't play sound, but I will be sending this um, to all of you so that you can uh, review it on your own later. Um, so I apologize for that difficulty. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Love technology. <laughs> um, last portion here, we're just going to go over a few uh, landmarks. I have a uh, Charleston Harbor chart here. Part number uh, 11524. That's the way that you can look it up online or at West Marine. I think West Marine is actually stopping the production of these. They're not keeping them in stock anymore. They're becoming um, kind of an old school method of, of navigation. Uh, everyone's got now the uh, electronic chart plotters coming out on their boats. And, well, I like to keep one of these on my wall at home, so I brought this in. Um, we're, we're going to go over a few spots here that maybe uh, you weren't aware of. This is um, Charleston Harbor down here. All of you see um, Captain Graham is the main screen. 
thumbs up if all of you see Captain Graham as the main screen. Okay, great, thank you. I'm here, Charleston Harbor. Uh, the entrance to the ocean, very bottom corner. Am I off screen? You're on screen. Um, uh, bottom of the chart. The bottom isn't very much on screen. Well, I can picture myself, so I'm making sure. Um, so at the very bottom left corner, we're uh, we're looking at the ocean, right? And this is the entrance to Charleston Harbor. On our right, there will be red buoys, and then Sullivan Island here. Uh, on your left, this is Morris Island, a very, very popular place for people to go and hang out on the beach, sandbar. Um, that's that's basically the weekend party spot. We come on a little a little farther in. Rebellion Reach, you're, uh, if you look right, then you've got Crab Bank and the entrance to Shem Creek. A lot of good restaurants, bars, and hangouts here. This is a popular place for boaters. And uh, that's where all the crab fishermen hang out and keep their boats. While he's um, talking about the waterways of Charleston, um, I know we have some ladies that are actually not from Charleston. I saw earlier that we have somebody from Treasure Island in Florida. We have somebody from Orlando. Shout out to Ingrid from Sarasota. Um, and then I see uh, Elizabeth from Long Island. So we have, we have people from all over the map. Um, so thank you guys all so much for joining us. Why don't you guys type in while he's talking about Charleston. And even if you're not from Charleston, some of your favorite, um, maybe sandbars, local sandbars, um, favorite places to visit on the water. So we can talk a little bit more about that. And then um, Captain Graham can show a little bit on the map. Um, sorry that I interrupted you, but Go ahead and get back to. Good to see you. I'm a Long Islander here. Uh, represent New York here. I'm from Sea Cliff. Um, anyway, we're still heading on down halfway through the harbor. We look right or starboard off of our starboard side because we're heading north. Uh, you see Chem Creek. And then uh, again, as we go a little farther here, this is Patriots Point with uh, you know, the aircraft carrier, the submarine. You've got uh, Charleston Harbor Marina, good place for mooring up overnight. Uh, they've got fuel, they've got restaurants and, and shops. Uh, on your left is down the opposite way, Shoots Folly. Uh, it's an old uh, Civil War monument. But, um, but there's Shoots Folly here, I can't see it. But uh, beyond that is downtown Charleston, or the peninsula, where the cruise ship terminal is. Um, if you follow down the peninsula here, you get into the Ashley River. Uh, the Ashley River uh, is, starts at the uh, bottom of the peninsula. They call that. Uh, call it, um, oh, I have a line blank. Well, uh, the first thing you'll see once you get into the Ashley River is the Coast Guard Station, and then uh, Charleston Harbor. I mean, sorry. Uh, Charleston City Marina, Ashley River Marina, and Bristol Marina. These three all have fuel and amenities, places to moor. Uh, you, you could cut left there into the Wapu Cut and continue down the ICW, or you can keep on going up the Ashley River towards uh, Dolphin Cove Marina. Um, the, not the name I was think, trying to remember just before, at the bottom of the peninsula, this, the Charleston Battery and Rainbow Row. Very scenic, uh, big parks for all the people that aren't from Charleston. This is like the uh, main hangout area where uh, most of the boats kind of be cruising around this area. So uh, if you head up towards this way, back up the Cooper River, you've got the main Cooper River Bridge and a Ravenel Bridge. And you can make a left onto the Cooper River or a right onto Wando. Um, and plenty of uh, plenty of spots to go up there for uh, um, cruising around, but nothing for about 10 miles up the Wando until you get to Wando Marina. And up the Cooper, there's a Cooper River Marina here, everyone pointing, and it goes on up for uh, probably about, I think, 60 something miles. No, actually, it'll be about 30 miles until you hit the, uh, the locks, so a series of locks. Um, Lake Moultrie. 
We had a couple people uh, tell us some of their favorite spots. Dee Dee says she loves the Waccamaw Wak River heading south. Um, also the Waterway Springs and Bonita Springs. Um, Perfect. Good. I'm going to find them on our Charleston Harbor chart. But yeah, but we love good, hearing about yeah, them. I want to take some more trips down to Florida. Actually, Brain Max sent me down to Fort Lauderdale last month with a nice yacht. I hope I'll get more deliveries. Um, I think you could get to the Waccamaw River from Charleston to um, the, uh, now I'm going, having a point, uh, the marine up, up by May in Pauly's Island. You're right. It, it is actually um, a little bit north of us here. In yes. Um, we also had M. Edwards say that she loved Fort DeSoto with Skyway Bridge in the background um, near the gateway to Tampa. I'm from Tampa, so shout out to you in um, Tampa. Um, Elizabeth said she loves the gray South Bay, Long Island with inlet to the ocean. Do you, are you familiar with that one, Captain Graham? Yeah. And my brother is actually from uh, Long, Long Beach, Long Island, and uh, some good fishing out there, too. A lot of good striped bass, uh, bluefish. And then we have somebody who lives, uh, Shannon, I live on the ICW, just north of the good old rock pile, north or of Barefoot. The local hangout there is Bird Island. Um, wow. Very tricky in boat swings if no aft anchor with that current. Um, right down here is Sullivan's Island near the entrance to the ocean, but if you cut up, uh, you probably can't see, but this is the ICW. I was talking about something that would be probably up about six feet away from my chart here this way. Um, it is a beautiful ride between here and uh, um, what would be the next major town, I guess. The, uh, uh, McClellanville, there's not much in between here. Uh, you got Ondal, McClellanville, and then Georgetown. So it's very wide open. Uh, a lot of scenery, you can see some bald eagles, a lot of marshland, great sunsets, and quiet. This is where I like to hang out. Especially when you're going up the ICW, uh, you're passing a few of the uh, chain islands, the barrier islands. It, it goes to Sullivan's. Uh, well, I, I, if you're trying to remember the names of these islands, they do go in alphabetical order from uh, Capers. It starts with C, D, E, I. So Capers, Deweese, um, Isle Palms. Oh, no, well, actually, it starts with Bulls, Capers, Deweese, Isle Palms, and Sullivan. It goes in alphabetical order. Uh, some of those islands you can actually camp out on and uh, have fires and enjoy yourself. Uh, so, anyway. A lot of good stuff to be had here in Charleston. Um, I wish I had more time to talk, and I wish I could have you all here in person. Yes, we did go over a, bit, a little bit on time, but I do want to um, open the floor to any questions that may have come up. Um, again, this was recorded, so we will be sending this out to all of you along with the presentation. Um, but while uh, we wrap up, do we have any questions that anybody would like to maybe unmute and ask, or you can type in the chat there? I have a question to start. Oh, God. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. I heard somebody. What about where are some places, some good places to get fuel? How do you know where you can stop for fuel? Uh, if you have a, a copy of the Coast Pilot, they do sell these uh, uh, books at West Marine that do give you information about places that you can stop if you're doing a long trip. But uh, here in Charleston, um, some of the most popular places for fuel would be Charleston Harbor Marina at Patriots Point. Uh, we've got the downtown run on the Ashley River here with uh, three marinas, City Marina, Ashley River Marina. That's the most popular fuel uh, dock down here. And uh, there is um, there's also fuel up in the... Uh, well, it's not on this chart, but basically, I would say if you want to get fuel, it, I would go to Patriot Point or Ashley River Marina. Right. Well, I haven't seen any other questions come up. Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you, ladies, again. Thank you, Captain Graham, for your skill of expertise. Um, we will be putting on our regular Women on Water classes. Again, it's a large part of what you um, saw here today, classroom style, but then we also get a chance to get out on the water um, on the boats. So I keep those up to date on our Facebook page. 
Um, so go make sure you like the Marine Max Charleston Facebook page. That's where I put all of our events. So when we start doing these women on water class, um, again, hands on, uh, you get a lot of intimate time with um, Captain Graham who can show you how to drive, dock, um, tie knots, hands on. Um, so once we start putting those up again, um, we, please take the class again because uh, you always learn something new. It will be a little bit of a refresher, but you know, there's always different ladies who ask different questions. Um, and again, it'll be an opportunity to get hands on um, on one of the boats. Um, so thank you all again so much. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, please share, we'll be doing uh, virtual classes to get our regular women on water classes back um, on schedule. Um, but other than that, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day and stay safe. Thank you. I just have one quick question. Will you notify us if you do a hands-on or we have to just keep checking the so, Facebook page? I, as soon, usually if, when you like the Facebook page, um, it'll send you a notification, like it'll pop up, you know, right okay. an event. So that's the okay. easiest way to do it. Um, just because we have so much interest in the classes fill up pretty fast, um, it's easiest to go on the Facebook page and do it that way. We also update it on our Marine Max um, events page. Um, if you already receive our emails from Marine Max, then we do send out emails when we put on the class as well, so you get notified that way. Um, I just recommend that once we do start putting them on to try and sign up if it works for you. They're usually always on a Thursday um, afternoon, and we typically do them at the Daniel Island Marina. Um, so just keep a lookout for that. Awesome. All right, Thank you guys.